During the late 80s, handheld gaming began to realize its potential with the release of the Nintendo Game Boy, revolutionizing a brand new way to play home console games on the go. While other companies attempted to topple the Nintendo Portable behemoth, none would come anywhere close to taking the top spot from them. The Game Boy line of systems would be all the way up to the early 2000s with the Game Boy Micro, and would be regarded as one of the longest running consoles of all time. With Nintendo looking to remain unstoppable in the console market, one console would have a very interesting story for its development and would have one of the most rocky stories ever produced. On this edition of the Uncommon Valley, we look at the history behind the console that was doomed to fail from the very start, riddled with crime and much more. As we check out the crime-riddled past of Tiger Telematics Gizmondo, the worst-selling portable console of all time. During the late 70s and his early teens over in Uppsala, Sweden, Stefan Eriksson was always picked on for his weight. He'd later go to the gym and lose that weight, and would be brought into the world of crime where in the 1980s, he would begin assembling his own underworld crew, ranging anywhere from stealing various car parts to selling illegal weapons and drugs. He would spend a total of two years prison sentence time during a 1988 bust where officers would find a shotgun and 10 small bags of cocaine that were on him. But life of crime for Erickson did not slow down, because as soon as he was let out of prison, he would begin committing more crimes with way more complexity than the ones that he attempted previously. This would cause local authorities to join with other detectives in order to investigate the rigorous crime sprees that were under the now-named Uppsala Gang. This would expand the rate as to which the crimes ranged anywhere from robbery and extortion all the way up to counterfeiting and bank fraud, along with many contacts with other criminal syndicates from eastern and western countries. Then in the very early 90s, Ericsson would become a very well-known name in cafes and bars around the Uppsala and Stockholm regions. Most of all that knew him would consider him a very wealthy playboy. It wouldn't be very long until investigators arrested and convicted him on charges of assault and even going as far to put around 20 million in counterfeit Swedish kroners, which was the equivalent of over 2.6 million dollars US. Then when he was let go of prison in 2000, he would work for a company by the name of Eagle Eye Scandinavian. It specialized in both global and telecommunications. The company was headed by none other than Carl Freer, who was in charge of various other ventures, such as a medium firm, filming production company located in Spain, and an auto dealership in France. The other thing to note about Freer, while he did seem tame on the outside, he's also had a history that was very similar to Ericsson. For example, one situation occurred when Freer forged his own parent's signature for a loan when he was only 18 years old. While it was confirmed that the investigators found out that he did in fact commit this crime, Freer denied these allegations. But despite those claims, Freer and Ericsson would be working together in prospect of expanding the company to other countries. That's when Freer got the idea of developing a device for the video gaming industry, one that they would attempt to not only rival, but hopefully dethrone as the current king of the handheld market, none other than Nintendo, and its current behemoth, the Game Boy Advance. While companies like Nokia and Sony were looking to release their own consoles in order to compete against Nintendo, Freer would bring in a tech engineer by the name of Steve Carl to design a console that not only played games, but would become an all-in-one media device. So the decision was made to go forward with the development for this device, and looked as though that Freer and his team would be ready to take on the world of gaming by storm, or so they thought. The original name of the device was called GameTrack. In October 2003, they began to first publish news about the device being developed on the website. This news was, in fact, the response to the news that Nintendo was working on their new handheld, and the soon-to-be-released Nokia Engage. But one important feature that they thought would work with this system was to allow parents to track location of their kids who were using the device. The reason was to be able to stop crimes that were being carried that involved children. It was a pretty controversial idea, as the very idea could potentially backfire for parents. 
as even Nintendo had gotten into trouble with parents before with a chat room feature that was going to be used for the Nintendo DS. So the decision was mainly shifted over to a gaming platform, as it was becoming too much of a headache to develop for. In December 2003, due to a dispute with another company over the name GameTrack, they presented the new name of the console as Gizmondo, and made its debut with a concept product at the Las Vegas CES event. Later on, it was also appeared at the German Seabit show in March 2004. What was being presented at the show brought real interest in the console, that people seemed excited for the prospect of owning one for themselves. As for the final version of the Gizmondo, it comes in at a resolution of 320 by 240 pixels, and the overall size of the display is 72 millimeters. The processing unit was the Samsung ARM9 processor, which ran at 400 megahertz, and an NVIDIA GeForce 3D 4500 for the graphics. It was a 128 megabyte 16-bit DDR RAM and 64 megabyte ROM. With its built-in speaker and Bluetooth capabilities for multiplayer gaming, the Gizmodo had a removable battery if that one ended up getting depleted. It has a 3.5mm jack connecting with an audio headset and SD flashcard reader. The operating interface of the device was Windows CE, which was possibly one of the few plus sides of the console. It even had a JPEG camera and a removable SIM card option. You could even send text messages on this device. The Gizmondo launched in the United Kingdom with only a single game in its library, Trailblazer, whereas its launch in the United States had seven other games available at launch. A further 30 titles were known to be development for the console, but all were cancelled before their release as Tiger Telematics went bankrupt. This hurt the Gizmondo because these were supposed to be launched at the time of the console's release. Several games were claimed to be capable of using augmented reality, most notably the unreleased game Colors. This game was intended to be the first GPS game of its kind due to its GPS capabilities to allow the player to be tracked. Other games supposed to arrive on the Gizmondo were Motocross 2005, Hockey Rage 2005, and Sticky Balls. Sticky Balls was significant to the lineup because it had multiplayer features. Games for the Gizmondo were only available in the United States through a small number of kiosks that were located in malls. There were no certified retailers who were selling the Gizmondo games either. When Tiger Telematics went bankrupt, there was no marketing to tell people about the games, and what's worse is that there was no distributor on who could ship the game to different parts of the world. All of those factors culminated in the very abrupt end to the console's future. Gizmondo was released in the United Kingdom on March 19, 2005, priced at €229. Euro. The Gizmondo was available from the Gizmondo flagship store on London Regent Street via Gizmondo's online shop and other major online retailers such as Argos, Dixon's, Curry's, and John Lewis. Although there was no precise number given as to how many units were introduced in the retail channels, Gizmondo's text service allowed people to send text messages using prepaid Vodafone accounts bundled with the console. The Gizmondo would end up selling 1,000 within an hour of launch, and a month after initial release, a variant of the console with the GPS-assisted Smart Ads bundle would retail at around €129. Euro. This would also be released during the late summer over in Sweden in 2005. A smart ads enabled Gizmondo was going to cost less, but would display advertisements on the Gizmondo screen at random intervals. However, smart ads was never enabled in the Swedish markets even though the technology was readily available. The smart ad system was intended to be kept in the system so that advertisers could subsidize a part of the cost of the unit. These advertisements would be downloaded via the device's GPRS data connection. This was a great way to market their own items along with various other products, but the manufacturing team went overboard here yet again. The funniest part is that the smart ad service never came into play for the Gizmondo itself. It was never activated and users who paid for the reduced price of the smart ads enabled device did not receive any advertisements on their console. In the United States, the Gizmondo was launched in October 22, 2005 for a retail price of $400, which was over $100 more than the Nintendo DS. However, for a smart ads enabled device version, these were only available at kiosks located in shopping malls throughout the United States. They were located in the western corner of North Carolina, and only 8 of the planned 14 games were ever released in the US. 
there was little to no advertisement done for the Gizmondo, and if there were any, it was located in magazines that showed up in all places Nintendo Power magazine. This showed how desperate the company was to get the word out, as there was little to no interest in any potential buyers. Within three years after Gizmondo's debut, Tiger Telematics would go under and it would officially be bankrupt after $300 million in debt. Only weeks after that, Ericsson would crash a Ferrari Enzo on the Pacific Coast Highway while driving around 162 miles per hour. He then pleaded guilty to two counts of embezzlement and one count of illegal gun possession. He then served two years in jail on those counts. Then the same year, he was arrested on suspicion of Grand Theft Auto and cocaine possession. There was also a report filed by the Securities and Exchange Commission that found some troubling information on how much money the company was bleeding right around 2004. Certain individuals like Stefan Erickson were being paid over $867,000 for being the senior executive on top of earning around $2.3 million in additional bonuses and various assets. This on top of Freer's earnings of over $1 million, along with $2.4 million in assets. And it wasn't just the executives who were getting high payments, but it was also their family and loved ones who were also earning big payouts in hundreds of thousands of dollars. To quote a British liquidator, they lost a hell of a lot of money, more money than most people would ever see in a lifetime. While the Gizmondo project brought in over $2.6 million profits, it quickly burst into heavy damages of over $263 million in losses. In 2005, Carl Freer was fined around £135,000 by a court in Germany for cancelling check payments in a transaction with a car dealer. Freer claimed he cancelled the checks because he thought that he was being sold stolen cars. Then that following year, a collection of weapons was found in his home in Los Angeles by the Los Angeles police. However, no charges were filed against him. Free resigned in October of 2005 from Tiger Telematics when there came reports of the company meddling with criminals. He then resurfaced in 2007 when he announced his intentions to revive the Gizmondo brand. For big news in that year, the plan to release this new version of the Gizmondo was that they were going to release it in a brand new model along with 35 brand new games upon release, along with confirmed manufacturing base that was going to be located in China. He even planned to release the console at a very low $99. With plans to release it in May of 2008, this was then pushed back to around November of that year. And then by December of 2008, the console was still not ready to be launched, and Freer blamed the difficult economic conditions for this. But the reality of the situation was because he couldn't get any potential backers to help fund the new console. In August of 2012, he spoke with Eurogamer about the project, stating that he was still hoping to launch it, and doing so against all odds would be any entrepreneur's dream. It's hard to make a case for a gaming console that was trying to be various different things, from a texting device, digital compass, and a place where advertisements can be watched to save people money. But was it possible that the system could have worked compared to other competitors? With the right development team, it could have technically worked in the general market, and might have potentially be a rival to both Sony and Nintendo. But the only moniker that the Gizmondo will forever be known as, the worst selling video game console of all time, selling only around 25,000 units in its very short lifespan. Check out the other videos on our channel today for more obscure video gaming history, and thank you for watching The Uncommon Valley as we look to the past into the present.